If you're a fan of football, then you're probably familiar with stories of the NFL's biggest draft busts of all time. Whether it was your team who completely whiffed on their pick, or it's an infamous case like Jamarcus Russell completely giving up and just cashing his paycheck, it's interesting to learn how the experts could be so badly wrong on a player. Unsurprisingly, these busts aren't just limited to the NFL draft and we see similar stories of players not living up to the hype of their college recruiting ranking, with recruiting services sometimes missing horrifically with their ratings, with even the highest ranked recruit in the country not necessarily a lock for a solid NFL career. From massive legal issues to just completely giving up before even playing a college game, these are the stories of the number one overall recruits who failed to live up to their hype. And just to clarify, my bar for a number one overall recruit being a bust is failing to earn a second NFL contract. Let's get into the video. First up on the list is Ronald Powell, a very tragic case that was unfortunately out of his control. Coming out of Moreno Valley, California, Ronald Powell emerged as the most exciting prospect in the class of 2010. Powell played a mix of defensive end, linebacker and tight end for Rancho Verde High School and he absolutely dominated. Standing at 6 foot 4 tall and weighing over 230 pounds, he was a natural fit for defensive end at the next level and his senior year stats of 80 tackles, 13 sacks and 28 tackles for loss underlined this perfect fit. Powell was an extremely sought after recruit and hyped prospect and he is one of only two prospects on today's list that was considered the number one consensus prospect across all three of the major recruiting services. He would make the decision to swap the West Coast for the East Coast and committed to the University of Florida to play under Urban Meyer who had captured multiple national championships during his time with the Gators and sent countless guys to the NFL. A seemingly solid choice from Powell, but unfortunately, his time in Gainesville would not be as productive as he had hoped. In his freshman season, Powell was not a starter, but also he did not redshirt, playing in 13 games, starting in one and recording stats of 25 tackles, one sack, and 2.5 tackles for loss. All in all, not bad for a true freshman in the SEC playing for an elite program like Urban Myers, Florida. Hopes were high heading into his sophomore year with the expectation that he would step up into a starting role. And he did just that with a strong season that saw him start 12 games and record stats of 32 tackles, six sacks and nine tackles for loss. Not well beating stats, but pretty solid. And with two years of eligibility left, Powell had more than enough time to keep developing and become the wrecking machine that the recruiting services had forecasted him to become. Unfortunately, however, his junior year was the point at which the train came off the rails and through no fault of Ronald Powell's with three dreaded letters summing up his downfall. A. C. L. Devastatingly, in spring practice before his junior year, Ronald would tear his ACL and was faced with a significant spell on the sidelines. As all sports fans know, this is an injury that needs no introduction and can have the particularly cruel effect of sapping some of the athletic ability that makes a player so special when they make their comeback. But another tragic blow would follow with Ronald Powell again tearing his ACL while rehabbing from the first tear. Absolutely heartbreaking luck, and unfortunately, he would never be the same again after this year from hell. Unsurprisingly, he took a medical redshirt year in 2012 following the two ACL tears, but in 2013, he made his long-awaited comeback, but he would start only eight games, and while a serviceable player, his stats of four sacks and seven tackles for loss weren't the eye-popping, game-changing ability that he'd flashed in his high school days. As he was a junior, Powell had the option of another year with the Gators to boost his NFL stock, but perhaps understandably, after everything that he'd been through, he would opt to enter the NFL draft and avoid risking his chance at a payday by taking another year in college. The former consensus number one recruit in the country would be selected in the fifth round of the 2014 NFL Draft with the 169th overall pick by the New Orleans Saints. A big fall from what had been expected of him when he arrived in Gainesville, but an opportunity to prove everyone wrong and bounce back at the highest level of the game. But Ronald Powell's NFL career was a complete bust. 
In his rookie year with the Saints, he would appear in 14 games, but with minimal playing time that saw him record just two tackles for the season. He was then cut by the Saints ahead of the 2015 season and would bounce around a couple of practice squads but continued to have injury issues and after getting released by the Seahawks in 2017, his NFL career was officially over. There was one last stop with the Orlando Apollos of the Alliance of American Football League but again, injury would scupper this for him and then the league was abruptly shut down, ending his football career. With NFL stats of just two career tackles, he unfortunately has to go down as a bust, given how highly rated he was as a college recruit. But it is hard to blame him for this, as he was given atrociously bad luck. Tragically, this story has a very sad ending, as this year, on January 16th, it was announced that Ronald Powell had passed away at the age of just 32, with no cause of death provided. The story of Ronald Powell is a very unfortunate one, and it's hard not to wonder how things may have shaken out if he'd never have torn his ACL. Really, really sad stuff, and may he rest in peace. If the story of Ronald Powell was defined by bad luck, then the story of Doriel Green Beckham was defined by idiocy. Born in Missouri, Doriel Green Beckham would establish himself as one of the best wide receivers in the history of high school football at Hillcrest High School, with ridiculous stats that began from when he was a freshman, where he scored 13 touchdowns and put up over 800 yards. As a junior, he put up a monster 1,706 yards and 15 touchdowns, and then went even better in his senior year with 2,233 yards and 24 touchdowns. If you were a high school corner up against this guy, you knew it was going to be a long night. And Green Beckham would end up breaking the all-time record for high school receiving yards. Alongside dominating in football, Green Beckham also starred in basketball and athletics with blistering speed. Standing at 6 foot 6 tall with a reported 40 yard dash time of 4.43 seconds, it's no wonder that Doriel Green Beckham was a consensus 5 star recruit with rivals having him as their number one overall recruit in the nation for the class of 2012. Unsurprisingly, just about every school was after him, but he would make the bold decision to stay home and committed to his home state Missouri Tigers over the likes of Alabama, Texas and Oklahoma. Doriel Green Beckham would see playing time in his freshman year, but after 5 games and just 5 catches for 125 yards, he would pick up his first arrest on drug possession charges along with two teammates. A fairly minor offence, but it meant he missed two games before returning, and he ended his true freshman year with stats of 11 games played, 395 yards, and 5 touchdowns. All in all, not horrific for a true freshman in the SEC on a fairly middling 5-7 Missouri team. Hopes were high heading into his sophomore year, and he did not disappoint. Doriel would play in 14 games, putting up 883 yards and scoring 12 touchdowns, as he helped the Missouri Tigers to a stunning 11-1 regular season, with Missouri competing in their first ever SEC championship game, which they would lose to Auburn. Things seemed to be coming together for Doriel Green Beckham at this point, and if he could improve in his junior year, then he was almost definitely heading for a high round draft selection. But the off-season would prove to be a complete and utter disaster for him, and it would end his Missouri career. The off-season began with another arrest for drugs possession that would result in no charges. But when a story emerged alleging Doriel Green Beckham had forced open an apartment door and pushed a woman down a flight of stairs, Missouri would take the decision to dismiss him from the football team. Out in the wilderness, Doriel Green Beckham would finish out the semester as a Missouri student before transferring to the University of Oklahoma. Under NCAA rules at the time, he would have to sit out a full season before being allowed to play. Green Beckham would file a waiver requesting immediate eligibility, but this was denied, and Doriel Green Beckham spent a full season as a scout team wide receiver for the Sooners, unable to play in a season that should have seen him NFL bound. The expectation was that Green Beckham would be back with Oklahoma next season, but after receiving feedback from the NFL that his draft stock was actually already high enough to be considered a day two pick, Green Beckham would decide to forego his remaining eligibility and declared for the 2015 NFL Draft, 
The Tennessee Titans would select him in the second round with the 40th overall pick, a stunning showcase of just how highly his talent was rated given the off-field issues and lack of playing time he'd had in his last year. But this was a pick that the Titans would come to regret, and fast. After a rookie year that saw Doriel Green Beckham put up 549 yards and four touchdowns, you'd think he would have a future in Tennessee. But clearly, Doriel Green Beckham was an off-the-field headache, as Tennessee would opt to trade him just one year after picking him in the second round sending Doriel to the Eagles and in return receiving backup offensive lineman Dennis Kelly. This should have been a wake-up call for Doriel Green Beckham that his time was beginning to run out, but it wasn't. And after a fairly lackluster 2016 season, in which he had 392 yards and two touchdowns, the Eagles would decide to cut him and he would never sign with an NFL team again. To last just two seasons in the NFL after being lucky to be drafted in the second round, given his turbulent college career, is 100% a failure for a guy formerly ranked as the best player in the nation by rivals for his class. Since flunking out of the NFL in only two seasons, the only headlines that Doriel Green Beckham has made have been more legal issues, with an arrest in 2017 for drunk driving, followed by yet another drugs possession arrest a year later, along with a resisting arrest charge. These charges would get him probation for two years, and he would violate that probation in 2021, serving 180 days in a Missouri jail. Since then, there hasn't been anything in terms of news, and his Instagram is very quiet. Given that he is now 30 years old, it's fair to say that he has completely wasted his potential, and has to go down as a major bust, as he never came close to living up to the hype of best player in his class, and was outshone by other class of 2012 receivers like Stefan Diggs and Amari Cooper. A rare prospect, an elite talent, and a gifted athlete are just some of the ways that Robert Kim Dietschy was described as a high school prospect. Kim Dietschy was the consensus number one recruit in the nation across the three major recruiting services, and he was described by recruiters as a younger version of NFL Hall of Famers Reggie White and Lawrence Taylor. Kim Dietschy was a complete game wrecker for Grayson High School in Georgia, registering 18 sacks and scoring 17 touchdowns in his junior season while also starring in basketball and athletics. Another monster year on both sides of the ball in his senior year cemented Kim Dietschy as the clear-cut top recruit in the nation for the class of 2013, and there was an all-out war between colleges desperate to sign the talented defensive lineman. Robert Kim Dietschy had always desired to play in college with his older brother Denzel, who was starting for Ole Miss at the time, and many thought it was a slam dunk that he would follow his brother and play at Ole Miss. However, there was a spanner thrown in the works when Kim Dietschy committed to Clemson while on a visit, professing his love for the school in the process. But with immense pressure from his family, including both his brother and his mum, he would eventually back off this commitment to Clemson and narrow down his options to Ole Miss and LSU. And in the end, he followed through on his promise to play with his brother, by signing with Ole Miss as the cherry on top of a legendary recruiting class that saw Ole Miss land four five-star recruits with Kim Dietschy, Laramie Tunsil, and Laquan Treadwell making up the all-time top three highest rated recruits to ever commit to Ole Miss all in one class. Unsurprisingly, this sudden surge in Ole Miss's recruiting power was completely powered by cheating rather than a deep-rooted desire to play in Oxford, Mississippi but considering players are openly getting paid now, we could just look at it as Ole Miss being ahead of the curve. Either way, Kim Dietschy packed his bags and went off to join his brother as part of a recruiting class that was supposed to put Ole Miss at the table with the Blue Bloods and potentially fighting for a national championship. His Ole Miss career started off fairly strong too, with a freshman season that saw him named a first-team freshman All-American. He followed this season up with two more years of stellar play, and although his stats don't jump off the page at you, he was definitely an impressive player. His junior year saw him record 26 tackles, 7 tackles for loss, and 3 sacks, but he was named a second-team All-American and first-team All-SEC player, 
highlighting the level of disruption that he was causing offensive lines. Although his recruiting class didn't end up bringing Ole Miss into national title contendership, they were an impressive team, with the highlight being a 2015 win over number 2 ranked Alabama in Tuscaloosa. There was a slight blemish on his record though, from a bizarre incident which saw the nearly 300 pound Kim Dietschy fall 15 feet from a hotel window. Kim Dietschy was taken to hospital, and when his room was searched by police, they discovered a small amount of narcotics, and charged Kim Dietschy with possession. Ole Miss would suspend him for the bowl game as a result of this, and Kim Dietschy would release a statement apologizing for his actions. After missing the bowl game, Kim Dietschy would decide to declare for the NFL draft, with the expectation that he would be selected in the first round, and the Cardinals would oblige by taking him with the 29th overall pick in the 2016 draft. So far, so good. The best college career of this list so far, and the highest draft selection. So why is he on here? Well, Kim Dietschy's time in the NFL can only be described as a flop. In his rookie season, he played in just five games and recorded just a single tackle for the season, and he was publicly called out by head coach Bruce Arians for his lack of maturity and lack of hard work. This was followed by his second year, where he played in 12 games, but again, he recorded just 11 tackles and started zero games an extremely poor return from the first two years of a first round draft pick. His 2018 season was better though, with 32 tackles recorded and 4.5 and sacks with 9 tackles for loss, although an injury would end this pretty promising season after 14 games. He was finally beginning to contribute and it seemed like after a slow start, the former number one recruit in the nation had arrived. But from here, his career nosedived dramatically with his knee injury seemingly serious as the Cardinals opted to decline his fifth year option and then released him just a couple of months later. He would bounce around between the Dolphins, Seahawks and 49ers, but he never saw significant playing time, and after that he would next surface in the USFL with the Michigan Panthers, but even they would end up cutting him before the 2023 season. Kim Dietschy is still playing football, and in 2024, he is currently signed to the Edmonton Elks. But given the amount of hype and potential that scouts saw in him back in high school, he unfortunately has to go down as a bust. Sadly, it seems that as soon as he matured and began to progress as expected, a serious knee injury halted his momentum, and he is now clinging onto the game by the skin of his teeth in the Canadian Football League. But at least he made the NFL was selected in the first round and made some millions. The same cannot be said for the next player on the list. Antonio Alfano is by far the most recent player on this list, coming out of the class of 2019. But his story is so weird that it sticks out to me a lot and I just had to include him in this video. Alfano is a New Jersey native defensive tackle and was considered the number one recruit in the country by 247 Sports, who are, in my opinion, the best at recruiting evaluations, although maybe after this case, you'll disagree with me on that one. While Alfano was an elite high school prospect and a machine on the field, there were some rumblings of red flags. He would transfer high schools three times and reportedly rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. To the point it was speculated that Penn State refused to take Alfano's commitment to the school as it would have led to at least two current Penn State recruits decommitting due to how much they disliked Alfano. While Penn State allegedly wasn't an option, it didn't really matter as Alfano held offers from the likes of Alabama, Georgia, LSU, Ohio State and USC to name just a few. Alfano would make possibly the safest decision possible by committing to Alabama to play under Nick Saban, and it seemed like a match made in heaven, given just how many great defensive linemen Nick Saban has sent to the NFL. Combine legendary coaching with the gifts and size Alfano was bringing to the table, and it seemed like a one-way ticket to the big league. But it would fall apart disastrously early for Alfano at Alabama. He had been viewed as having the potential to possibly see the field in his freshman year, but a disappointing showing in training camp meant that Alfano was in a low position on the depth chart and would not be seeing the field barring a miraculous turnaround or a bunch of injuries. This wasn't the end of the world by any means, but perhaps this was a contributing factor in Alfano unraveling. As in September of 2019, he would completely stop attending classes and practice 
before deciding to enter the transfer portal and end his Alabama career before it even began. As news of his transfer portal entry hit the media, his family were quick to suggest the reasoning for his struggles and decision to transfer was due to his grandmother being gravely ill and on life support. There were some alternative theories posited on Reddit that suggest his downfall could have been due to excessive partying, but regardless, Nick Saban would suggest that Alfano had basically quit on the team and was gone. With the news about his ill grandmother, many were expecting Alfano to transfer to Rutgers to be closer to her, but instead, he would transfer to Colorado to play under Mel Tucker, who he had a previous relationship with due to Mel recruiting him for Georgia. But whatever Mel Tucker sold Alfano on was clearly a lie, as just one month after Alfano enrolled at Colorado, Mel Tucker would leave the Buffs to go and coach Michigan State, abandoning Alfano in the process. Pretty horrible luck. But what wasn't bad luck was the lack of care that Alfano showed while at Colorado, summed up by him getting suspended from the team just two months after joining for skipping workouts and arriving late to his one-on-one -on -one meeting with the new Colorado head coach. It was reported at this time that Alfano was continuing to battle mental health issues and he was eventually reinstated to the team. But there was further bad news on the horizon as he began to suffer from seizures and was diagnosed with epilepsy that meant he was not medically cleared to practice or play. With seemingly no prospect of playing football in the near future, Alfano would opt to leave Colorado having again never played a single snap of football and he did not surface in the transfer portal this time, seemingly walking away from the game of football completely. But Alfano wasn't completely done with the game and he would make a comeback after finding a doctor capable of working out a treatment program that would allow him to play football safely. Alfano would resurface at the JUCO level after a few years out in the wilderness, opting to enroll at Independence Community College. Yes, the one from Last Chance U. But he would again never play in a game, and after a year at Independence, he would instead transfer to another JUCO, this time at Lackawanna Community College, where he would finally play his first ever snap of college football. Alfano appeared in five games for Lackawanna in the 2023 season, recording pretty strong stats of 14 tackles and four sacks before, I'm assuming, he got injured and was unable to return for the rest of the season. It seemed he was rebuilding himself and perhaps could have been heading back to the Division I level with rumors of an LSU commitment, but instead, he has made the bizarre decision to enter the 2024 NFL Draft on the back of five JUCO games. This decision to enter the draft seems crazy delusional to me, and I don't think that it's down to any eligibility issues given that 2019 was his first season in college. Even weirder might be the fact that his Twitter post declaring for the draft has a picture of him in an Alabama uniform, even though he has never played a down for the Crimson Tide. This might be an interesting saga to keep your eyes on, as I think there has to be no way he actually gets drafted. And I'd honestly be surprised if he even manages to get a training camp invite, but you just never know with someone as athletic as Alfano. Slightly funny tidbit, some random account recently circulated alleged athletic testing scores from Alfano's pro day, which showed him to be potentially one of the most elite athletes to ever grace the NFL, with a 4.4740 time despite weighing 285 pounds. This blew people away, but it was obviously completely fake, and Alfano's actual pro day numbers should be released any day now. But he might actually need to test to this ridiculous level to stand a chance of being drafted after such a lackluster college career. Antonio Alfano undoubtedly has to go down as a complete and utter bust, and will probably be the only one on this list to go undrafted. But let's wait and see, maybe, just maybe, he can surprise us. That wraps up today's video. If you want a part two, then let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed the video, please drop a like. If you like this video, then check out this video I made on college football's worst catfish scandal and subscribe to the channel for more content just like this. I've been Nerera and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.